We've been in a series called The Great Awakening, and it's been this journey through the book of Acts. And this morning, what I'm excited about is that we're going to talk about what it means to be his church. The word book of Acts, we use this term a lot. You see it on, on, on billboards. You see it in, in books. People write about it. But what does it actually mean to be and fight for this book of Acts church type of reality? We've been in this journey. This is part six of our series. And we've been in this journey where it starts off in, in, in Acts chapter 1-8 where Jesus surrounds his disciples. And he's like, yo, come here. And they're like, yeah, I'm coming, right? And he gives this mandate to be his witnesses. And he says, wait on the Holy Spirit. And he, and he says, be my witnesses to pretty much everyone that has a pulse. And so in Acts chapter 2, about 120 of them get together. They're gathered together. They're worshiping together. All of a sudden, the, the Bible says that the place that they were meeting was shaken. That fire from on high would come. They started to speak in different languages. Now, listen, this was freaking people out, but there were also a couple of people uh, that were amazed as this was going on. But God's power was fully on display. We see later that Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, rises up and he preaches the gospel for the first time. And this is what it says. It says, as he preached, over 3,000 people decided to believe and were baptized. Now, here's the beautiful thing is that I believe that this reality here is for the here and now and not just something we read about. Amen. Amen. But what we're going to look about, what we're going to look at today is we're going to kind of investigate and figure out what were the rhythms of the early church that allowed them to live lives where there was a sudden sweeping and marking change whenever they gathered together. You guys down for that? If you're down with that, say, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Starting in, in, in verse 42. In Acts 2, this is what they said they did. This is what Luke is, is, is observing about this church. It says, and they what? And they what? Amen. Themselves. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came over every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling all their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Come on, sometimes you just got to read this to your kids. Say, hey, receive this food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. If you're taking notes, the title of today's sermon is The Marks of an Awakened Church. The Marks of an Awakened Church. Let's pray. Jesus, Father, there's a lot in here. There's a lot in this book. There's a lot you called us to as your church. Father, I pray for the next few moments, Lord, that we're going to take away all the things that we feel like are impossible for us to reach towards, and we're going to allow your Holy Spirit to work. In Jesus' name we pray. Nobody said? Amen. amen, amen. Hey, high five and everyone say, let's do this. Let's do this. If you're online, say, let's do this. You know, today is Super Bowl Sunday. Is anybody excited about today in the battle, right? Any, any Rams fans in here? Any, any Rams fans? All right. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. Any Bengals fans in here? Make some noise. Come on, come on. Now listen. I got to be honest with you, this is Super Bowl Sunday, and traditionally, for me, this is one of the hardest weeks of my life. I mean, like, literally, for, like, probably the last 15 to 20 years, this week, when this week hits on the calendar, it makes me mad. Why? Because I'm a Jacksonville Jaguars fan. (laughs) Is anybody feeling me right now? Like, there's... It's like every single year, like I have to look forward to becoming friends with disappointment. Like it's just, it's just crazy, right? Man, it, it, somehow as a Jacksonville Jaguars fan, no matter how great of a start you have, it always finishes bad. 2017, we were loaded. People thought it couldn't be, people thought it couldn't be done. Everyone was looking at the Jackson was like, oh, man, this is their chance. They face the New England Patriots, right? We come up short, and it's okay. I'm ready for the next season. I'm like, oh, man, we got this. Jalen Ramsey, we got this. What do they do? Next season, they trade the whole team away. 
It's like, are you trying to be bad? <laughs> Even now, we've had two seasons where we haven't been the best, and to make matters worse, we end up hiring staff and coaching staff that likes to kick. No, I'm just joking. But, <laughs> but in all seriousness, like, man, <laughs> we hire coaching staff, and we go from bad to worse, and it's this, it's this rhythm of, of disappointment that, that just bothers me. Can anybody feel the pain of a Jacksonville Jaguars fan, right? If you were a Cleveland Browns fan, you weren't that far behind. Like, you know, if you were a Chicago Cubs fan, like, you just started, you know, right? Listen, we're so embarrassed as Jaguar fans. Like, I see halfway raised hands in here, right? Like, we don't even, we're not even proud enough to raise our hand fully. It's crazy. Now, now, now thinking about like this, this rhythm of just being bad, every single season, at the end of the season, I'm just like, oh, you know what, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm completely done. Like, let me just jump on the Bengals bandwagon. I'm, you know, like, here we go. But somewhere along the line, every single year, no matter how bad the Jacksonville Jaguars do in their season, somehow they end up wooing me again temporarily with hype. Like, like, like Jacksonville Jaguars, like they're the best with this. I mean, somehow they find all the clips from the previous season, like all the good plays, there's like 10 of them, right, in the whole season, <laughs> and they put all those clips together. And then they go over here and they get the best announcing voice in the history of announcing voices. Like, this is someone that as they speak, you want to run through a wall. <laughs> and they mash those videos together. And they call it a hype video, and they release it. And then all of a sudden, I watch the video, and I'm sold that next season is going to be our season. <laughs> See, I don't know if you discovered this, but, but we live in a culture of hype. We live in a culture of immediate gratification. We live in a culture that wants quick results. We live in a culture that does not like to wait. See, it's something about this hype culture that not just even related to football, but even related to life that draws us in. When this hype card is played, it will have you believing that your best life is now one relationship away. Even though when you were 15, you had a promise ringing, you came up with the, these values that you were gonna stick to. Somehow, when the hype card is played, when this immediate gratification is played, somehow standards go out the window. Somehow, when this hype card is played, when we think about our personal life and our personal goals, we feel like we can achieve bigger, better, faster results overnight. Somehow when this hype card is played, hype will use social media to play the comparison game. Am I right? Like, like hype will take all of your insecurities' best starts. All the things you're insecure about, they will showcase their best starts, leaving you starve for, a star for, for the finish line. They'll never tell you how it's going, and they'll very rarely, with these insecurities, tell you how it ended. See, hype is dangerous. See, hype may last the night, but it never gives you peace in the morning. See, this is not just with the things that are involved in our life, but even as a church, it's easy for us to buy into hype, to have a big weekend and to look around, and the reason why they're here is because we got a bunch of free cupcakes, and, and we had Maverick City up here, and they were leading us in worship, and we got a chance to add another 400 seats. See, hype will confuse you with success. See, church, what I've discovered is that it's easy to get people interested in the hype, the hype of faith, the hype of a diet, the hype of a relationship. What the Holy Spirit is, I really feel like is trying to show us this morning is that more than hype, we need substance. As we're looking at this, this, this passage, what Luke, from years of observation, is trying to convey to us is more than hype, we need substance, and that substance only comes with long and steady devotion. <laughs> See, as we look at this, this chapter, 
What allows this church to turn the world upside down is not quick results, it's not hype, but it is long devotion in the same direction. Are you guys buying in with me? Alana, are you shaking what, what I'm putting down right now? See, this, this early church, what I would tell you is that they didn't vote themselves to a million things, but they devoted themselves to four things. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with church programming and and being connected in so many different things, but what this group of people did is that they devoted themselves to four things. See, here's the big idea today, this morning. I want you to write this down because here's the whole point of this, this sermon. It's devotion to the essential, not dabbling in the superficial that truly changes the world. How do we change the world? It's devotion in these four essential things, not dabbling in the superficial that truly changes the world upside down. What are those things? Number one is this. Write this down. They devoted themselves, number one, to the apostles' teaching. Can I be honest for you, with you for a second? The Bible is hard, y'all. How many of you guys would say, like, man, it is confusing? Can we be honest? They're like, man, pastor, you know. <laughs> like, it is, it is confusing. It is hard. It is challenging. The ways of Jesus are, are otherworldly. This wasn't even just a, a challenge for us during this day. This was a challenge for him during his day. In Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you see this moment where Jesus is coming on the scene. He's stepping on the scene, and he has this new kingdom, this new way of living that shatters the culture. See, the Bible is it's not for the faint of heart. Yet, I do want you to be encouraged because what we see in Acts chapter 2 is that Peter preaches a message, 3,000 people respond to the gospel and become believers and become like new members, they're a new member orientation, and yet this new group finds a way to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. They decide to devote themselves to the word of God. See, during this day, there was no New Testament. Like Luke, when he's writing this, he's observing like years of like this foundation and this work in progress, right? All they had in this moment was the Old Testament, right? And although that was a great lens, what the apostles had during this day is they had a time with Jesus. They had face time with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, right? And so they got a chance to be around Jesus. They got a chance to hear his heart. They got a chance to hear the things he cares for. And this lines up with Matthew 28 with a great commission because it's this great commission where Jesus challenges the disciples. He says, go and make disciples. What? Baptizing and teaching to observe everything I've commanded you to do. So when we see this being fleshed out, it's not just that the apostles are like, man, Jesus is gone. Like, what do we do? No, no, no. They are doing the very thing that Jesus has commanded them to do. And the believers are gathering and listening because they know that those, those words are not just empty words, those words are life. See, what I need you to see is that no matter your impression of the Bible, I need you to see that the Bible has life. That scripture is God breathed and is useful for, for correction and teaching and training and righteousness. And like there's something about scripture, Psalms 1 talks about this reality where the person that, that devotes them, their, their life to the word of God they're like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in their season. How many of you guys want to yield fruit in your season, right? I love this because at the end of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there's this grand conclusion of his sermon with an illustration. He says, hey, the person that hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man that builds their house on the what? The rock. And when Hurricane Sally comes... And when the winds blow, this foundation is steady. James 1 talks about this, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. The, the person that hears my words and puts them into practice, this is what he says, paraphrase. He says, hey, when he put it into practice, you're like looking in a mirror, and you look intently at the mirror, and you walk away knowing what you look like. But if you don't put my words into practice. It's like going in front of a mirror, looking, kind of seeing what you look like, brushing your hair a little bit, getting style right, and then you walk away and you forget. So you want to change the, the world upside down, it's going to take a devotion to God's word. See, what we see in the scripture is that not only 
what this church knew, but this church was a studying, learning church. There was a lot of things that Luke could have said about this church, but he opens up by saying that this church had a devotion to the word of God. See, somehow Luke knew that they could get distracted by just the experience of God. Can you imagine, like, how many times that we, we, we allow uh, ourselves to get distracted by the moves of the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit does this thing, and we're like, oh, man, that means I'm holier than now. Man, God did his thing through me. Oh, I don't got to have a quiet time. I don't got to read his word, right? We can get so distracted by experience. But what Luke says is that they had a dedicated like, vision for his, his word. See, listen to me. The measure of our obedience to God's word and ultimate satisfaction in him is tied to how well we hear from God and we respond to his voice. Let me say that again. The, the measure of your obedience. You're like, man, I, I want to put this into practice. I want to follow the ways of God. Listen, the measure of your obedience and ultimate satisfaction in him is tied to how well you hear from God and respond to his voice. See what... The apostles know is that if they would use their mouths to echo his mouth, they would change the world. So number one is that we see a church that is devoted to God's word. What does it look like to put this into practice? How many of you guys have ever watched the movie Karate Kid? Raise your hand. Like any Karate Kid fans? All right. A lot of you guys, you know, there's this guy named Daniel Russo, right? You guys remember this, right? And Daniel was amazing. That's Daniel right there. You had Mr. Miyagi, who was this old wise soul, right? Do you guys remember the part when they were doing their training and trying to figure things out? What was he doing? Wax on and wax, right? And what was Daniel's attitude? Like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe like he has me like doing chores for him. Like, I can't, like, like I'm done with them. So then he would like take a, a paintbrush and he would go to the fence and he would, you know, go up and down, right? This is kind of like, like reading God's word. At first, it seems like drudgery, just to be honest with you. It seems like, man, how does this, this word, this ancient text relate to my life? Let me challenge you. Sometimes it's going to take the wax on, wax off effect. Sometimes it's going to take the swipe up, swipe down effect. Because over time, what seems senseless, over time is going to make sense. God's word that in the beginning, it just seems like, man, it doesn't relate to my life. Over time, this is what John Piper says. He says, hey, if there's any truth in God's word that does not seem true in your life today, what I want you to do is I don't want you to run away from it. Instead, I want you to beat it into your heart until it becomes true for you. See, see what Daniel Russo was doing is he was, he was beating these karate moves into his heart. And it didn't make sense. And he wanted to quit. But eventually, it went to a, a, a stage of desire, and then it entered the stage of delight. And then when he was in the battle of his life, it came out, and it was as natural <laughs> as anything he's always done in his life, right? See, there's, there's God's word where I want it to be written on your hearts. I want it to be written on your hearts. We get so used to especially like our microchurch leaders at time, we get so used to just delivering messages and it comes down and it goes back out. Sometimes the key, the antidote for your heart, your soul, is to just sit and allow God's word to marinate in your soul. Man, this is the type of church that I want us being a part of, a church that is so devoted to God's world, word that we change trajectory of the people around us. Somehow with God's word, we allow the people around us to be shaped and formed because the word is written on our hearts. Amen? Amen. So number one is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Number two is they devoted themselves to fellowship. Now, when I say this word fellowship, this kind of brings me back in the day because, um, you know, I grew up in a missionary Baptist church. Um, in Jacksonville, Florida, off of Prospect Street, and I'm a pastor's kid, and so I grew up in the rhythm of church. You know, I was in church Sunday through Sunday, it seems like, but every fifth Sunday, we would have this fellowship where we'd come together, we would have potlucks, we would, you know, hang out, have some fun. As a kid, I would just run around and try uh, different mac and cheeses from, like, different people and stuff like that. It was crazy. That's my favorite food, you know. Um, side note, if you want to get me some, you know. Um, <laughs> And it's funny because in this day, <laughs> this church is old, 
there, there was no, there wasn't, it wasn't called the dining hall. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, like this area was called what? The, the fellowship hall. <laughs> anybody, anybody went to a church like that? It was like the fellowship hall, right? Where fellowship happens, right? And, and it's crazy because when we look at the text, I think we kind of think fellowship is that. It's this tamed down, like, version of community, and yet the word that Luke uses, this cornea, is this, this idea of, uh, of that. It wasn't just that they gathered together, but when they gathered together, they had what they had was commonality. What they had was, was this built root meaning of, of sharing. See, which, what does it mean to be devoted in fellowship? It means that they had in common their faith in Jesus. It means that they had in common his God for their life. It means they had in common the desire to worship him. Every time they gave together, it wasn't like, oh, my gosh, we got to worship. Holy, there's no one like it. Like, no, like, the precious Lamb of God. Oh, you know, like, holy is the Lamb. You know, like, like the, I'm being goofy. It's the last <laughs> But it wasn't, but that wasn't it. Like when they came together, there was this, this heart of like, oh my gosh, like we get to worship Jesus. Like, man, like, like even today, like it was so precious as we worship him in the back. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you can just tell, like, we've gathered to worship Jesus. Man, if you're online right now, and let's just say like, like you're, you're gathering together online, you couldn't make it this week, it's raining, it's a storm and all this stuff, right? You're online, listen, you don't just gather in front of the laptop just to gather, no, no, no. Like when you gather, gather. <laughs> Come and have something in common with us. See, not only did they have this commonality of wanting to worship, but they also had a chance to share the same victories, and they also had a chance to share the same struggles, which allowed them to live out verse 44 and 45 where it says, all who believed together had all things in common and they were selling their possessions, ooh, and their belongings, ooh, and distributing them and the proceeds to all as any had needs. This is hard because I think our vantage point is that, man, oh, this socialistic society, oh, my gosh, you know, they had to. No, 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 Like, there was something about this society here that it wasn't a have to. It was a I get to. Different, right? They would gather together, and when someone had need, I could just imagine, like, oh, let me get my pocket foot. Oh, let me get my hug ready. You know, like, they were, they were devoted they were ready because it wasn't a I have to, it was a I, I get to, I get to. I was talking to one of our college microchurch leaders and they were telling me a story about a, a young lady in their microchurch that got COVID and UF has kind of changed their policies so they don't really have like dorms that you can kind of stay at. Probably a year ago they had like quarantine dorms, kind of now it's like you know, kind of figure it out. And so she was trying to figure it out and she was freaking out and she was talking to her microchurch leader, who's a guy, by the way. And she's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And so this microchurch leader goes home and talks to his roommates and he says, hey, I feel like we're supposed to leave our place and we're supposed to allow this young lady to stay at our place while she, so she can recover. This microchurch leader made it in their minds like, hey, it's easy for me to find another place. Like, we can go and find another place. We'll clean it up. We'll make sure there's no presence of God in the place. But, man, like, while you're recovering, church member, brother, sister, come and be in my place. Because, and I'm, as I'm talking to him, it's, it's not like he's like, oh, my God, you know, come and stay with me. Like, no, no, no. Like, he was getting giddy. He's like, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. I was talking with another microchurch member, and um, it was one of my microchurches about a year ago, and we were getting ready to meet and gather together, and on the way, this, this, these two people were traveling, and they see this horrible accident. And so they were like, hey, we're going to be late to microchurch, but it's okay. We need to respond. And so they ended up responding um, to this accident. They ended up meeting this young lady, and this young lady in this moment is like a wreck, not from Gainesville, doesn't really have family, 
The car is total. It's her fault. I mean, there's just so many things. The list go on and on. She has a job. She needs transportation. She does not know what to do. These microchurch leaders, they end up just befriending her and hearing her story. When we make it to the, the microchurch, we're like, yo, where are you? Are you okay? And they're just like, oh, my gosh, we have to share this need. And so they tell us the story, and they say, if there's anything you can do, we're going to give 100% of everything we get here. We're going to give it to this young lady. Within 30 minutes, there was over $5,000 that was raised. College students. Not I have to, but a what? I get to. Can you imagine being a fly on a wall when they're delivering this check to this young lady? Oh, my gosh. Like, man, like, that's the type of church I want to be, guys. See, here's the thing. She gets this money. And eventually she comes into a relationship with God. Because of the generosity from their microchurch, she was able to see the generosity from her God. And that would change her life forever. See, God has called us to this supernatural type of reality, not this ordinary church. I don't want to belong to an ordinary church. I want to belong to a church that gives themselves for the least and the lost. I want to belong to a church that says, hey, you're my brother, you're my sister. What I have, you have. The connections I have, you have. We're in this all together. It's not just a financial big, but even like, man, can you imagine what it would be like to belong to Gloria's microchurch? The one that was preaching up here? Oh, my gosh. Like, can you imagine going in and, and maybe you're a college student and you just had a rough week and or maybe your mom and you're going through finances or maybe your dad and you just got a, a hard health decision that you got to make, and you're just trying to figure it out, and you're in the lowest of low, and you, you're not in a place where you're remembering God's word, right? And then all of a sudden, you make it a glorious macro church? Oh, my gosh. Like, this lady's going to pray for you. She's going to hug you. She might even feed you, you know, like, like you don't know. But I can tell you this, that you're going to walk out better than you came in, right? Why? Because it's not what she has to do. It's what she gets to do. (laughs) Man, they fellowship in a way that what verse 43 says, it says that awe and wonder came. Can we gather in such a way where awe and wonder is the norm? Man, you gather and you're just like, oh, my gosh, something is about to go down, right? Right? That's the type of reality that I want us to live. I have this, this Lego piece here, and it's pink. Um, <laughs> and this Lego piece represents me. <laughs> and I'm out here on my own, and just like all of us, I'm in the same boat. I'm trying to build my legacy. I'm trying to build my life. Somehow... <laughs> Over the last couple of years, I've been convinced, convinced that I could do bad all by myself, that I could pick myself up from my own bootstraps, that I could succeed all on my own. And as we're looking at this on, this, on its own, this piece seems pretty unimpressive. On its own, this piece just, it's just a piece. Why? Because it's not fulfilling its purpose. See, the purpose of this piece was not just to be isolated. The purpose of this piece and the design of Lego was to be a part of a family, to be a part of a house, a temple. See, I love how 2 Peter talks about this, the first or second, and, and it's like this moment where it's like, hey, you, you and I, we, we are stones, and we're a part of this house. And the beautiful part is that when we come together, Although I might be a stone and you might be a stone, when we come together, we know that Christ Jesus is the chief cornerstone of this house, which means when we come together, you get Jesus. (laughs) You're like, man, I'm just lacking my faith. Listen, come together, you get Jesus, the chief cornerstone. Like, there's nothing that he can do. But but here's the thing. We Even here, there's this fight for for preeminence, right? We want... We want to be prominent. We want to be important. We want to have our faith seen. We want our our gifts to be known. But listen, the marks of the early believers was that they were just happy to be a part no matter what part they played. 
See, this is what I want. I love this moment in, in Second Chronicles where the temple is being finished. You guys remember this moment? And the Bible says that fire came from on high and it filled the temple. And the believers that were watching, they were afraid. They were in awe because the glory of God was on full display. See, here's the beautiful part about being connected to the temple is that when you're connected to the temple, you always see awe and wonder. You always see the glory of God. I want to belong to a church that allows us to see the glory of God because we also see in Acts chapter 2, this moment where now the temple isn't just uh, in, in, in stone, but now the temple are in our hearts. And so these 120 temples are gathered together worshiping Jesus. And what happens in similar fashion, the fire comes down. People are filled with the Holy Spirit. And God gets a chance to do something miraculous because they saw the glory of God. See, this is what I want, guys. How many guys would say, man, I want this type of reality in our lives, in this church. See, what we see is the, the, the book of Acts, this church, they didn't isolate believers to focus exclusively on their own relationship with Jesus, but they joined lives with each other and they made each party a vital vein in the body of Christ. Even right now, look at your brother or sister to your left or right. I gotta ask you a question. Do you have a pace setter in your life? Like, who's your pace setter? Who's the person that is keeping you accountable? I was hanging out with my friend the other day, and we were talking about this because a couple of years ago, we went to go and watch um, one of the Florida relays here in town, and um, really, really cool meet, um, high school uh, through professional, like they were race together, and so we had a couple of high school and college friends that were there, and so we were just like, hey, let's just go watch them, and so um, the problem and challenge with uh, meets, and this is what I kind of soon discovered, is that there's like a thousand different meets, and you only got like two kids, and so, so you're just kind of waiting, trying to figure out like when your people are coming up, and so in between the time, we would watch these races, and we would just kind of, you know, make some friendly bets. We'd be like, yo, yo, like, I think, like, such and such is going to win. And we'd be like, no, no, I think such and such is going to win. And so there's this one race, and I picked this young lady. I was like, hey, I think this young lady is going to win. And he's like, I think this guy's going to win. I was like, or this, this young lady is going to win. He's like, okay, sounds great. And so the race starts. On your mark, get set. <sighs> and she starts taking off. And my person is killing it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, my person is just, like, going around the curves, and she's exclusively, like, so far in front of everyone else, right? She's, like, leading the pack. And so she makes it around the first turn, and as she's going into the second lap, she just stops running. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> like, like what, just, like, what just happened there? You know, like, like, I don't see you grabbing your hamstring. You know, like, you don't look like you hurt. Like, we need, we need you to run, homie, you know? Like, <laughs> there wasn't any money on the line, but I was like, man, there's a lot of pride on the line here, man. Like, come on, like, what's going on, right? And so she runs this race, and then she just retires. And I'm, like, frustrated because, like, I don't win, he don't win, thank God. Um, <laughs> and I get to the end, and I'm, I'm talking to um, some of our students, and I was like, hey, what happened there? And she's like, what? I was like, this person ran and was killing everybody, and then they just quit. They just threw in a tower. It's a sermon for that. <laughs> and she looks back at me. She's like, oh, Mike, like that person actually wasn't in a race. That person was called the rabbit. I was like, well, what's a rabbit? That's weird. It's like, well, the purpose of the rabbit is to go before all the runners, and they're supposed to set the pace so that if you get their pace, you could actually do your personal best. And I was like, well, why is that important? It's like, well, because um, on your own without the rabbit, you might run too fast. You might run too slow. But the rabbit sets the pace that you could do your very best. When it comes to fellowship, fellowship wasn't just the gathering of those around Popeye's chicken on a fifth Sunday afternoon. But the gathering of God's people when it comes to fellowship was that you would get around people and you would run a race and you would be in community in such a way that we're pulling out the best in each other. Like, man, when we go to microchurches, it's not just to go to microchurch. You go to microchurch and you allow them to pull out the best in you. See, so many of us, we're, uh, we're struggling with different addictions that was supposed to get broken in fellowship. We're struggling with, like, depression and all these different things that we've been dealing with and battling for so many years. But listen, on your own, sometimes you're not going to be strong enough to get to Jesus. 
In the, in, in, the, in the Bible with this issue of blood, you see this moment that for 12 years this woman had an issue for blood, and then Jesus was walking down the street, right? She was gathering a community, right? She was able to fight her way through the crowds. But listen, sometimes you're going to need people to carry you through. Sometimes you're going to be like the paraplegic that's going to have to have four other people around you and say, hey, take me to Jesus, right? See, fellowship is, is so important. See, see, Acts 41 highlights 3,000 people being baptized and saved but look how they broke this. They, broke in, they, they met in the temple, which was big, but they also got small. See, again, how do we break addictions? We do so in fellowship. How do we meet the needs of our church? We do so in fellowship. How do we develop our love for God, his mission, and community, which is living in the green? We do so in the fellowship. See, my, my challenge, my plea for you this morning is to not allow the enemy to overload you from the gift of fellowship. So we see this in the book of Acts. That this community, they met not just based out of obligation and have-tos, but they created an atmosphere, a place where they could be transformed. Let me say something really hard, but really honest. If you do not have time for fellowship in your life, your life is not biblical. If you cannot make space, and I'm not saying that, hey, you got to go to every microchurch in the world, you got to gather to a microchurch, like, that would be great. But listen, if you do not have fellowship in your life, your life is not biblical, and you will never be able to bring out God's best in you. Because there's something about God's people that when you get around them, there are gifts inside of you that you haven't seen in yourself. There's something about being around God's people that they get a chance to identify gifts and they pull them out. So you need people. See, the first thing they do is the apostle teaching. The second thing they do is the, the fellowship. The, la- the third thing they do is the breaking of bread. In verse 46, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they, revived, or they, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Now, I know this sounds strange, but I need you knowing that for hundreds of years in the early church and the foundation of the church is that they, it, was, it was common for them to meet around the table. I know we talk about table and we think like, oh man, like that doesn't really matter. Or we think of this, this term table and it's like, oh my gosh, like uh, it's, it's just an ordinary place. It's, it's a place that we oftentimes overlook. But the table was the very place that Jesus would use in Luke 22, where he would bring the disciples together in the last supper, in those last moments. And it was the place where he would break his bread and he would reveal to the disciples for the first time that my body was going to be broken for you. We're like, man, like, what's the significance of a table? Well, Jesus used the table. Jesus used the table to also talk about the wine, that this wine that was going to be spilled was going to be representative of my blood that was spilled for you, that the righteousness of God could not come through your deeds, but it had to come through my blood, that there needed to be an exchange of blood. Your, your righteousness is not enough, but my righteousness is. Isaiah talks about, like, man, that, that your righteousness, even on your best days, is like filthy rags. It cannot be you. There's nothing that you, you can do. There's nothing that you can bring to the table, but I can. That I can. That I can give you peace with him. That I can give you eternal life forever, no, forevermore. See, there's something about the table that when Jesus used the table, it revealed him. It was a gospel injection. I think the challenge for all of us today is to realize that not only do we get devoted to the apostles' teachings, not only do we get uh, devoted to the fellowship, but when we break bread, it means that every single time we gather as believers, there should always be a gospel in- injection in that time. Like tonight is the Super Bowl. We're going to gather together, we're going to eat some wings, we're going to have some fun, I'm going to cry a little bit, and then get excited <laughs> for the Bengals tonight. What if we gathered as his people and we made space to remind ourselves of the gospel. Gosh, that would be great, right? Can you imagine if that was a daily routine? We have a tough day. We get a tough break. It seems like the world is crashing on us, but we know we're coming home to a, a table that is going to remind us of who he is and what he's done. Listen, the early church couldn't even live like this, sacrificially. Kind of like this Paul moment where he's like, hey, I consider all these things worthless for the sake of knowing and saving Christ Jesus. Like, the church can't even be like this without a daily reminder of the gospel. <laughs> They're like, hey, I'm willing to freely give up everything that I have, every resource I have. I'm, I'm willing to give up because I'm serving and I'm worshiping the one that has given up everything to me. 
why should I not do so in response? See, I think this is worth restructuring our family time. I think this is worth figuring out how to have daily injections with our family and our friends. This, is, this doesn't mean that, like, this always has to have, happen around the table. I love talking to Pastor Robbie, and he's like, hey, every day I'm, I'm going to school with my son, I'm, I'm going to have a gospel injection in the car. I'm going to remind him of who he is and, and whose he is, and I'm going to remind him of, of this moment that, that, that the gospel is, is good for his daily life before he leaves the car. See, man, if we can have these daily gospel injections, it will change the world. Two questions that I want you to write about and talk about with your family tonight. Question number one is this, is how can we be the community that helps others believe? How can we be the community that helps others believe? Man, like put some homework to this. I would love to know your answers, man. Email me. Like, I would love to be able to be invited in this journey. But, man, ask that question. How can we be the community, the family, the friendship group that helps others believe? It's not just that we just gather just to have fun. It's not just we, we gather and we play spades around the table. No, no, like when we gather, we might slam a spades card. But, listen, we're going to remind each other of the gospel. Second thing is this. Do other people or unbelievers, those who have yet to believe, when they see you gather, does it make them look at their lives and see something greater that's happening here than what they can experience in this world? Let me say it another way. When other believers get around you, are they able to look at what you're doing and be like, yo, the way they meet, the way they love, the way they serve, it does not exist anywhere else. Please tell me the source. That's right, Jesus Christ. Worship team can come out. But it's these two things that is going to help us to really become the church that he's always destined us to become. Amen? Last thing is this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. And the last thing they did was they devoted themselves to the prayers. Now, I want to kind of use this moment. I'm almost done. I want to use this moment. It's kind of like an object lesson for us all because this is the church. This is his people. Amen? Like we're gathered together under one umbrella. And this is what the Bible says. The Bible says in Acts 2 that people got added to this number, 3,000. They added those who believed because of a word that, that Peter gave. But what we see at the end in verse 47 is that people got added not by a word, but by how people lived. See, when I say prayers, this is, this is praising God and having favor with all people. There's, there's nothing like gathering with his church focused on lifting up a praise and an adoration for who God is. See, Luke, when they gathered together in a big group in a temple, and when they ate in their homes, no matter where they were in location, they always focused on God, and they always praised God for who he was and who he is and who he is to come. See, see, it's something about what we're about to do in just a second that, that man, I'm not asking for us to just gather and get churchy. I'm asking for us to gather in a few minutes and to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen? I remember when... Um, I remember when I first started following Jesus, and again, I told you I'm a PK, so grew up in the, the religious household, grew up in the rhythms of, of doing church, but I really didn't know God. And I remember I just accepted Jesus at a prayer night. It was a college prayer night, and everyone, all these colleges were gathering around Jesus, and I was like, oh my gosh, I want that. And I remember God transformed my heart at this prayer night, and I remember that Monday, I'm walking on campus near Broward, and I'm so overjoyed that I'm spinning around like a schoolgirl. I mean, it's just like, it's just crazy. I mean, like hands high, like hands wide, just spinning around. I'm just happy that my sins were forgiven and, and I had a place that I had a home and I had a savior that I can call my own. And I remember being at our Lincoln campus, it was one of our campuses a long time ago. And I remember this, this day, they, they, they didn't have worship service. And so I was kind of bummed. I was like, yo, like that's... Like, that sucks. Worship was, like, incredible. 
But they say, instead, we're going to go to the gym and we're going to get around tables and we're going to just eat a meal together and we're going to encourage one another. So that's what we did. We went in there, I get in the meal and I'm learning everyone's story and I'm just deeply encouraged. And during this day, they told us to stand up and we didn't really have um, a whole worship team. I think it was like maybe like a piano person or something like that that was just kind of playing in the background. And everyone stood up and instead of just singing songs, they began to read God's word. And when I tell you, although we read, it was, it was worship. It was the church gathered together because as the early church devoted themselves to the prayers, they really just made a habit of acknowledging God in all they did. That they recognized that the way that they're going to change the world upside down is not by their might and it's not by their power or strength, but it's by the Holy Spirit leading the way. So would you stand up with me? And I'm going to ask for us just for a moment just to be the church. So just close your eyes just for a second. Say, Jesus, say, Jesus, you are king. Come on, let's say it all together. Say, Jesus, there we go. Say, you are Lord. Jesus, thank you for allowing us to be your church, to be your bride. God, we move out everything that hinders our relationship with you. Jesus, we make space to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, use our words, use our gathering, use our fellowship, use this breaking the bread moment that people might know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here, listen, this is what we're gonna do. There's a couple of verses on here that we're gonna read together, all right? And I promise you, this morning I did it and I was almost in tears. But right now, I'm just going to allow the church to be the church as we read God's word. You guys down for that? Let's start. Ready? One, two, three. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Praise the Lord. Come on, can we just praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Praise the service of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Amen. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. And this is where one of my favorite times because as a, as a church staff a couple of years ago we were gathered together on the last day and we just began we were meditating on, on Romans 8 I remember the last day it was a short time but it was a powerful time and we began to remind ourselves of this I don't know who's in here today but let this speak over you God's word is that cool you ready here we go what then shall we say to these things if God is for us who can be against us He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Come on, isn't that good news? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let's say that again. Who shall separate? Come on, again. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sore? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. Come on, say that again. Say no. Say it like you mean. Say no. Let his church say the same. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Come on, can we make some noise right now? Come on, just praise the Lord. Maybe you just say, thank you, Jesus. Say, thank you, Jesus, that we're more than conquerors. That you are made a way. Listen. 
did anybody just feel something? Like it was like a, like, like you just felt like you were part of bigger, part of something bigger than your own, right? I don't know, I don't know if any of you guys felt this, but man, maybe you walked in with some worry. You got a chance to read God's scripture. And you walked out with peace. Man, maybe you came in with loneliness and you're wondering, like, man, is there ever a home for me? I hope that as you got around God's people, you would see, man, not only does he make a home for me, but he's prepared a place for me forevermore. Let me end it like this. Fellowship, I'm sorry, apostles teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And when these things came together, it would shake a world upside down. It would bring those who are lost, those who are in despair, those who are wanting something fresh, unique, forgiveness of sins. Those like this woman I talked about with the bloody, with the issue of blood, it would allow those that, that felt like they had no chance to come into the home of God. And this is what it says. It says that, man, as they did these things, the Lord added to their number daily who were being saved. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Because... One of my favorite verses is the start of Romans 8, 1, where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. One of my key verses that helped me to put away my, my addiction to poor, my addiction to sexual morality, my addiction to a number of things that I was dealing with in my college days. I just had to write that on my heart. I had to beat it into my heart. There is therefore no, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ Jesus. Whoever is in Christ Jesus is no longer condemned. I even just want to speak that over you. For those that are in Christ Jesus, you are no longer condemned. But the beautiful part of Romans 8.1 is what happens in Romans 7. In Romans 7, this is Paul's struggle with sin and struggle with with just the things of this world. He says, man, sometimes the things that I want to do is good, but I find myself doing the things that are bad. I have a heart to do and please the Lord, but man, the very thing I hate, I find myself doing. Has anyone ever felt themselves there? Maybe you hear today, you feel like that. Listen, you don't have to leave out the same. Here's what Paul says. He says, who will save me from this life of sin and death? Because we know sin kills. It destroys. It says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. How do we make it home? We put our trust in him. Today is the day. I was on campus this past week, and it was this young lady, our old lady, that was preaching on the court. A lot of you guys know who this, this person is. I'm not going to mention her name. And they kept speaking condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. Get right by by just trying really, really hard. And I'm in this conversation with one of the kids that's to my right, and, I was, and, and they're just kind of leaning in. You can see, they're, <laughs> you just see them in despair. And I look at them, I was like, hey, listen, here's the good news. That's not the end of the story. <laughs> yes, your sin kills. Yes, your sin separates. Yes, your sin destroys. It'll destroy your life, but that's not the end of the story. God has made a way for you to come back home. God has made a way for you and you and you to come back home. All you have to do is to walk in his arms. How do we do that? Number one, we recognize him as Lord. We, we recognize that he is calling the shots. We say, Jesus, I commit my entire life and I put it in your hands. But number two is we recognize that he alone is Savior. That he alone is the one that starts it and finishes it. You can't be good enough to get to God. You can't be holy enough to get to God. God is the one that qualifies you. And today I want you to hear the words, there is therefore no condemnation for you who trust in the Lord. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this sermon, be sure to click that like button. It helps others to find our videos. You can also post a comment about your favorite part of the message. Another way to connect is by subscribing to our YouTube channel. I hope your week is wonderful. Live Green.